Big Voices interview. The subject of the interview is Gilbert De Lao. De, De Lao. And today's date is 1-20 of 2012. This interview is being conducted at Neighborhood House and is a part of the Civic Voices International Democracy Memory Bank project. Gilbert, would you please confirm that you have signed the deed of gift authorizing the Memory Bank project to make this interview available to future researchers? Yes, I have. Thank you. Now we will begin with our first question. <clears throat> How do you think growing up on the West Side affected your upbringing? Ah, uh, well, good question. I, I was blessed to to be raised in a community that was, uh, you know, right now you, you the words that are, that we use that, that are being used now, uh, diversity, multicultural. You know, I, I, I was living that life way before it, those words became popular. So I, I, have, I was blessed to be, uh, be in a community that had a lot of Chicanos, Mexican-Americans, uh, Jewish folks, uh, Polish. It, it ran that, that whole gamut. And plus the, the other thing, too, I, I, was raised, I was raised in the time where um, uh, it, it, it was like, because I lived in the, in the West Side neighborhood, and I lived in a, in, in a situation where I lived in a sixplex. I lived in a place with my grandma, my uh, my aunties and uncles across the street lived my cousins, and all my friends had that had those same similar situations. So consequently, uh, everybody kind of knew one another. It's 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 like that song in Cheers, a place where everyone knows your name. Mm -hmm. That's kind of like what, what the West Side was. So. When we walked around the neighborhood, uh, there was always eyes on us, and I think that made, made that was a, made it real safe for our parents to, to. So we were able to roam around. We were able to go uh, go all over the neighborhood. We used to pick, have kids, you know, pick up kids and go play baseball, sports, and those kinds of things, uh, with all without our parents having to. Uh, you know, take us to practice or drive us somewhere. They just let us go. We just knew that when the street lights came on, that was the time to come home. So there, there was safety in those kinds of numbers. So it, it was good. The, the only, the only, well, I, I shouldn't say maybe it was a bad thing was is that if you were out there messing around, you know, somebody knew you, somebody knew your parents or somebody knew one of your cousins. You know, the word would get back to, hey, you know what? I just saw Gilbert down the street. So when you got home, you got a couple knobs or whatever waiting for you. But again, I I think it, it was it was it was good to be in, in in a neighborhood that had so much diversity, and you know years ago we I look back on pictures of my of, of my of my uh, of my community, and I think the words today that you would describe the West Side Flats where I grew up, you definitely would say it was a ghetto, a barrio. I mean, if you look at the structure, but you know when you're growing up, um, it, it it didn't feel that way. It was kind of like you know everybody was in the, in the same situation, and so when I looked at that, I, I, I thought of a, a a quote that I heard from the, I read about Dr. King. He said that you know we all may have came on different sh on different ships, but we're all on the same we're all in the same boat now. You know, in consequence, that's what we were, and we're all in the same boat. And again, didn't know the poverty that we lived in. Uh, we we may have been poor monetarily. But everything around us was pretty rich. Okay. Um, what activities did you participate in your youth to become a part of your community? The uh, the neighborhood the neighborhood house was was the, was the community center down on the West Side Flats. Everything you did for recreation you did at neighborhood house. The neighborhood house, the community center was like the the, the uh, was our universe. If you played sports, you did it at neighborhood house. Um, before you got a TV, if you wanted to watch TV, you go to the neighborhood house. The neighborhood house had this unique program called uh, toy lending. So they had this huge room, and then you could go and borrow table games, checkers, uh, sorry, uh, borrow uh, roller skates, ice skates, whatever, whatever the time it was, and you could check it out, take it home, and keep it for two weeks, and then, and, and then bring it back. Um, so, uh, so that's so I grew up with, with that, and one of the things that neighborhood house had to, as you hung out at neighborhood house as a kid, you always had a, an adult leader, who was always uh, you, you you were like in a club, and you always had an adult leader from a college, someone from the neighborhood, 
when I played sports for, for the neighbor dolls, uh, all the coaches came from within the community. They were all, you know, uh, Mexican American men. Um, so again, so you so you grew up seeing you know the role modeling going on down there, and so sports. Um, one year I was looking at a picture of a, of the neighborhood house, and there were some pictures of a, uh, the, the neighborhood house had, had had a thing called the doll club, where young girls could come. They'd come and, and be you know a dozen girls. They'd come in there and they and they get, get dolls and they play dolls and play, have tea and all those kinds of things. So I'm looking through these pictures, and um, I, all of a sudden I look at this picture, and, and there's my sisters in, in there doing that. And I didn't, I, I didn't know they were doing that because I was just more intense with, with, with things that I was doing. But again, it, it, the neighborhood house again what was the only game in town, and everyone that's where you did all your activities. Learn how to dance down there. I can still dance too, but I learned it down at the neighborhood house. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um. How did your early years influence your later years of civic activism? You know, um, grow, growing up down in the West Side Flats, being that, that the term that they used for us then was Mexican American, and as as we we're going to school, again, as I look back now, when I as I, as I look back on my life. One of the things that happened was there wasn't always a lot of reinforcements about in the schools about saying about being proud of who we were. The textbooks that we used, you very seldom said anything about the about the Mexicanos or the Chicanos. The uh, the pictures that you would see that you would use, see in the textbooks, they're always white people. Um, the uh, the people that the the people that were dark, they were usually the the people that worked at the uh, carrying the garbage hauler, uh, the ice man, those kinds of things. So, so growing up, then I, I, I kind of grew up, grew up thinking that um, you know the the my community, the, the Mexican American Chicano community, that it that it didn't do very much in the building of America. So I kind of grew up that way, thinking that kind of uh, you know what the heck did we do? Because everything was about white. White people did this. White people did that. You know, even in elementary school, when you, when they showed about uh, the kinds of food you should eat, you always used to be the food group. You know, if this is the kind of food you should eat for breakfast, this is what you had for lunch, and this is what you should have for supper. And up there on the bulletin board, you'd see, uh, you know, bread and milk and cheeses and all that. And I'm, you know, I'm thinking, man, there's there's no frijoles, there's no tortillas, you know, stuff like that. You know, so again, it it, it just Somehow, subconsciously, it, it plays a trip on you, you know. So, so I, that's that's what kind of kind of guided me later on in, in my life. I think um, back in so when, so in in the '60s when the uh, when all the movements were going, the Chicano movement, the Mexican, I mean, the Black movement, all those kinds of things, I really got involved real heavy with that. And um, one, and I, I, you, know, you may be asking some questions about that too. But one of the things that it did for me, though. Um, as as we started organizing the Brown Berets about about the Chicano movement and stuff, one of the things that it did for me, once once we established the Chicano Studies Department at the University of Minnesota, one of the things it did for me was that as I enrolled in in the Chicano Studies Department, all of a sudden, man, the, I'm, I'm learning about our culture. You know, I, I I didn't learn anything other than. Uh, you know, in, in high school, you learn about the Mexicans uh, fighting Davy Crockett at the Alamo. You know, and and then seven thousand Mexicans took you know took us thir took them thirteen days to you know to, to to hassle with Davy Crockett. So that's again, that's the only thing that, that that I remember being taught. So anyway, it wasn't until again that Chicano studies at the university I started realizing about you know the Aztecs, the Mayan, the Toltecs, and uh, the stuff that was grown in Mexico. You know, we corn, chocolate, I mean, you know, I, my ancestors, we fed the world, and yet none of that stuff was ever told. So as I was getting more and more in tune with that, I mean, I, I was like a little boy in a candy store, man. My, my professor was uh, Alfredo Gonzalez, and, and he he's the guy, and I, I, I had the, uh, I was blessed to be able to tell him this too, that he, he was the guy that opened up the door for me, man. It was like, when he talked, I was like a little, like I said, like a kid in the candy store. I had my mouth wide open, and I was just like, "Come on, give me more, give me more, give me more." 
and uh, oh my God! And, and then and then and then one year, I'm down in uh, I'm in uh, in Cancun, Mexico, at, at at a Maya ruins called Chichen Itza, and as I'm as I'm tour as we're walking as we're walking out of the place, there's this huge um, uh, what would you call it? You know, like uh, 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 where, where you can look up in the stars. Telescope. Telescope, but the, the whole thing, the the building. Anyway, there was a building that 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 uh, the Mayans did made. You know, thousands and thousands of years ago, and it was still. I mean, it was, it was all ruined, but you could, it was, you could still see it was it, what it was. And it's like, my God, again, another another thing about we're not getting credit. So I, that's what really started me going, realizing that. You know our history is rich, but our but our history in America has been neglected or distorted. So that's kind of so. After I was able to start realizing that, I realized this then that you know I must have always had kind of a complex of who I was and kind of a shame that I was a I was a Mexican or a Chicano. But um, but after getting all this information, I realized I realized this. You know, I don't have to I don't have to walk behind. I don't have to walk behind anybody anymore. I don't have to walk behind white people. I don't have to walk in front of them. You know, I'm no better, no or, or any less. I know I can walk shoulder to shoulder with a man because you know we did our thing here. You know, and, and now I realize that it was all self-taught, but I realize that now. Um, can you walk us through the neighborhood you grew up in? Uh, the neighborhood I, I grew up in. Uh, well, I'd say. Uh, I grew up on the West Side Flats, and that would, and I'd say West, that'd be West Side Story One, okay? When West Side Story One was again what I talked earlier, it was a, uh, it was it, it was it was a, it was it was a um, community that was started way back in the, uh, you know, in the early 1900s. First, the first wave there was new, uh, Lebanese folks, uh, then Irish. And then the then the Mexican then the Mexican community came, um, so again it, it it was a poor community, housing was really poor. I remember I didn't have we didn't have any hot running water, uh, in in our house. Uh, we wanted hot water. My mother had to fill, fill up this thing a pot and put it on the stove so we can get hot water. Um, we didn't have no it was so it was it was, it was poor that way, um, but it was rich. In a way, where I, where I said about earlier about you know meeting other cultures, and you know we didn't I didn't take it like that. That oh, where's a new culture? It was just for an example on Christmas. Um, you know my my Jewish friends. You know they'd come over and we'd, they'd have tamales, banuelos. Uh, uh, you know they bring me uh, matzo ball soup, uh, the Morgan David wine for my dad. Uh, so it was that that kind of interaction that was going on down there. So, and like I said, everyone was in the same boat. And so, and so one of the things happened then was that in my community, the West Side Flats, there were some floodings that would go on. Some real, 1950, 1952 were some real devastating floods. And after the, and after the floods of 52, the Port Authority said, you know, people living in the West Side Flats, you're living in a dangerous place, you're going to have to move out. We're going to have to get, get you out of there. So some people kind of objected to that, say, you know, we don't want to move. But the Port Authority said, you're going to have to. Uh, this is what we're going to give you for your property. You take it or leave it. And so, and so that's what they did. Starting in the early 50s till about 1963, they came in there and they knocked down everything, man. They took, we had, there were seven Jewish churches down there. And our Lady of Guadalupe, and they came in there and they knocked it all down. They knocked down our houses, our businesses, our place, everything, in order because they said it was unsafe because of the flooding, and and the uh, insult that they did to us later on in life is that after they moved us out of there, they built a dike, so that area doesn't get flooded anymore. And it was like you best. I mean, excuse me. It was like man, you know. Yeah, uh, uh, if you would have done that ahead of time, we would still be down there, you know. So it's some kind of environmental racism or that that we look at now. So so the thing then is that we had to go somewhere. So the area that we're in here right now, this was also called the West Side, but this is where mostly the white people live. 
again, the, 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 the per people of color uh, and, and minorities, we lived on the flats, up here was pretty much white folks. So now, these white folks get here that they're knocking down the flats. So those people are gonna have to go somewhere. So these folks that lived up here started a petition to, to, to say that we don't want the Mexicans to come up here. They have to go somewhere else because you know, if you let these Mexican people come up here, you know what they're gonna do? They're gonna, they're gonna ghettoize the community, they're gonna make this community poor, we're gonna, we're gonna, they're gonna make the trouble. They're gonna be troublemakers, and they're gonna, you know, fight with their kids. And and though they never said this, but the bottom line was, I think they were afraid that we were gonna date their daughters, man. You know, and guess what? We did all that stuff, man. So it came true anyway. But uh, so, but anyway, though, so they uh, they even they even they even had a, they even made a petition and took it down to the city hall and to the mayor's office to say, you gotta send them. We don't want them up here. So. Consequently, you know, the city said, you know, BS, they're going to move up there. So what happened then is that the folks that were living in this area now, they moved elsewhere. Some stayed, a lot of them stayed. Some moved further up to, to up to Cherokee Park. Some went to the suburbs. So now we came up here, and that's when we started living. So now, again, this now I call this now, this was West Side Story 2 for us now. And, and again, this is, and this is, so... And during all this time, though, there was always some kinds of friction with, with other groups. Uh, when we lived on the flats, my brother and, and, and a big group of guys, they called themselves the West Side Party Boys, they, they always had a hassle with the guys from up here and up in West St. Paul. There was always this conflict going on. So now, now when we moved up here, and now my brother and them moved on in life, and now we're the teenagers up here so that that same stuff started up all over again and and what was interesting was that um, we didn't realize this until we started coming to school up here and the kids that we started going to school with would tell us that one of the things that separated it separated this west side from the west side flats was this huge bridge this black bridge once you cross the bridge man you're into the west side so people, kids would tell us that on Sundays when they used to go on a Sunday drive with their parents that they would come and then when they got to the bridge, their parents would say, hey, we're getting to the west side, now make sure you lock your doors and then, they, then they'll drive through, you know. So, uh, and so then again, so now, so, so we were kind of like, uh, uh, we weren't the place for people to have their kids hang out. So now we're up here and now the other folks moved up to the Dairy Queen up in Cherokee Park so now those folks up there started calling their area, this was in the late, early 60s, late 70s, started calling that area the Upper West Side, and now us that moved here in this area are now called the Lower West Side. And you know, in just those two terms, upper and lower, man, you know, they connotate something. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so it, it, again, so, so going through the same kind of stuff we did down there, uh, it, again, this, it was diverse up here in this community. Uh, we. One of, the, one of the things I, sh I need to say, though, is that I think one of the things that the neighborhood house did for us, um, even though we, we felt the prejudice, we felt the, the, uh, the, the, uh, that feeling that people didn't accept us because of who we were or what we did or what we looked like, one of the things, one of our equalizers was that we could kick some ass, you know, and, and, I, and I mean that literally. I mean that in, in as far as in when it came to sports and football and basketball and, you know, baseball. Man, when you play, anybody from, when you come and play the neighborhood house, man, you knew you were going to get in the, you're going to have a good game. Didn't matter, it didn't necessarily mean that you, that we won all the time, but we were really competitive. And that kind of pride of, of who we were in our community was really, uh, was really strong. You know, I, I, if I'm going too long, man, just 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 let me know. You know, if, you know, if you need to cut me off, because oh, no, I can keep, I can I can keep going, man. No, no, we got two hours of time. Oh, 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 oh. We just need to make sure this is working. Oh. Um, did that? I'm sorry. Did that, I hope that answered your question. Yeah. yeah. Okay. What do you value when it comes to being a West Side leader? You know, first of all, I never liked that term. I never liked that term, being a, a, a West Side leader. You know, it, it's like, you know, white people aren't given that 
you know, white people aren't considered leaders. I mean, uh, so so if I'm working, if I'm working in the Chicano community right away, you know, or a black person, this is the the, the leader from the black community. This is the leader from the Mexican American community. Mm -hmm. Whatever it is, but you know, I mean, did you ever hear him say George Bush was the leader of the white people? Or you ever, I mean, you you never hear that. So. So being called a leader, it just it doesn't sit sit right with me at times, you know. But but I mean, but I understand what they're saying. But again, that same kind of stuff is not. I always saw that as prejudicial because they don't lay that same title on the on, on the white folks, and 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 it's like sometimes it, I feel like it things like uh, our, our folks need to be lead, you know. We have to be, need to be led, you know. Um, so. Um, I'm sorry. What, give me that question again. Um, what do you value when it comes to being a West Side leader? Uh, well, uh, this this is what I value as being a, as a, as a West Sider that that I've come to to realize after living and working in my community for for all these years and being in the West Side for I, I said five generations, but there's six generations of my family that that still currently live here or have lived here on the West Side. One of the things that I've learned. As, as it comes to doing things in my community, I, I realize that there's three kinds of people. There's people who make things happen, people who wait for things to happen, and then people who wonder what happened. And I was blessed to be around people that make things happen. Um, it, may, it may not always been right by the community how we got things done, but we got things done. And I was blessed to be around folks that wanted to get things done, that stood shoulder to shoulder on all kinds of different issues and concerns. Because um, because I've learned too, you know, that uh, whatever, whatever you're gonna do, you've got to have some doers. you got a lot of people that give you a lot of lip service, you know, ready to do all those kinds of things until you ask them to get some work done and then they don't. But uh, again, I, th I think that's what I've been blessed with, being around some good people uh, I've, I've got a, I've got a, uh, I've got a great family, that's that's been supportive of me of all all the things I did. Uh, early on in life, I, I was on the other side of the track, uh, you know, I was incarcerated and, and stuff like that, and uh, they still stuck by me, and uh, so. What challenges occurred when you tried to get people involved in what you were doing? Uh, well, for an, I, I'll give you an example. Again, the Brown Berets. It, it wasn't so hard, to, at least for us who initiated became Brown Beret members. Uh, 25, 35 of us that, that all, we all, we're all, we're, we were all on the same page uh, trying to do the betterment for our, for our, for the Rasa, you know, in education and housing, dealing with police brutality. We were all kind of on the same page. It, what was the difficulty was the the outside community, and and I can understand why. Um, uh, what what they saw us as we started the Brown Beret movement, people still saw, excuse me, Gilbert De La O, as the kid that took over the West Side West Side Party Boys when his brother moved on. They saw Gilbert De La O when he was uh, uh, started uh, the Latin Counts. They still saw Gilbert De La O as a, uh, you know, as, as a troublemaker, that that kind of thing. So now, after I went into service and came back, and we started the movement, uh, people were still seeing that too. And even my family, even my dad, even my dad was was kind of was, was against the uh, what we were trying to do in the Chicano movement. Uh, traditionally, uh, you know. Uh, uh, I don't like to use the word Hispanic or Latino, um, but but, I'll, but I, I, I like to say Chicano, and for me, Chicano encompasses all the other groups. But um, one of the things in our culture is that it's respect. Respect means a lot, and and one of the things happened was that as we start as we started the Brown Berets, we were questioning authority. We we questioned the police. We went to questioning the education system, and and my father and that generation. Um, didn't like that, you know. Again, they they were they were in in, in that mindset that uh, you don't question authority. Authority are, are are the ones who are supposed to, are the smart ones. They're the ones who are supposed to know everything. Uh, so, 
So it took a while. It took a while before that that generation of folks uh, started buying into what we did. And and I'll give you an example of that too. What, what's going on today? Um, down on Harriet Island, you see what's being built down there. I don't know if you see. There's something being built down there right where the flagpole is. And what's being built there is is a memorial to veterans. Uh, uh, we wanted to make it for the Mexican American Chicano veterans, so, but so as we as we started meeting and organizing and doing things like that, uh, we're running into a lot of uh, into a lot of stumble blocks because, you know, the city was saying, well, man, we, we you can't just do this for the Mexicans, you know, what about everybody else, all those kinds of things, but well, what our concern was, was that. Uh, the the, the 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 Chicano veterans, which includes, you know, like I said, the Puerto Ricans, the Cubanos, all. I mean, we defended America since the since the Revolutionary War. You know, we we picked up the gun and defended America. We died for America. Uh, we bled for America. I was wounded twice in Vietnam for America, and. And never getting any recognition for that, so you'll never see. So all the all the all the movies and stuff you read about the, about wars, you always see guys like John Wayne or Earl Flynn. I always see white people are the ones out there. You never saw the Chicanos or the Latinos in, in 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 a positive way defending America. So there, there's a saying. There's an old saying that they say something like this: "Until the lion, until the lion gets its own historians." The lion hunt is always going to be in favor of the hunter, so that's what we. That's how. That's where we're at now. Is that we have to tell our own story. So, as we were trying to tell that veteran story back in '68 when we had the Brown Berets, if this generation of folks that were, were that were fighting us because of who we were or or, or who we thought we were still were, we would have had that memorial a long time ago. But now, I mean, so now '68. Now it's 2012. But it's but it's happening. You know. So that's one of the things that I think that that's kind of uh, as I look back on things. If we if we would have had more buy-in, um, like I said, my father, that generation were, were were against it. But now, now since they lost their jobs, jobs moved on. They closed the packing houses. Now all of a sudden, now all those folks are starting to started realizing that, you know, um, we've been treated as second-class citizens, and and so now they got on board. Now we're you know we are where we are today. But if they would have jumped on board a long time ago, we would have been a lot better than what we are today. When did you realize you had become politically aware? Politically aware. You know, um, you know. I, I think again. I, I, I think it's it's, it's it was when we started the the, the movement, when the Brown Beret, the, the Chicano movement started. Then we started realizing, start seeing how things are really run, and uh, start seeing all the false promises. I mean, e e even even just last week, I, I was called to say they wanted me to get involved with this group of people that wanted to make sure we go out there and hustle people to vote because now this is the time for the Hispanics, you know. And and it's like you know, I, I told them, you know, I'm t I'm, I'm tired of that. Every time there's a go back to the '60s to, to present. Every time there's a presidential election, we always hear these terms. You know, it's, it's your turn. It's your time now. It's for the Hispanics, and that bullshit, man. I'm, I'm sorry. I mean, it's just like it's the same thing, man. You know, same thing happens. These same people get in the office. The people that we elect, even our own hint that get in the office, and all these promises that they say, oh yeah, when I get in the office, that it's going to it's going to happen. So and it, and it isn't, you know, it doesn't happen. So, um, so so when that, when did that when when did I awake that? I'll be aware of that well, I, again back in the '60s. But what I always was aware of was was about voting. My father, my father. I remember the days when my father had to vote. He, he always, you know, back then you could take a couple hours off of work, and I remember that was really important for my dad to vote, and. So I kind of grew up knowing that, that that that's part of being an American. That's part of being your citizenship is that you have to vote, plus you have to defend America. What did you specifically do when you were a part of the um, Brown Berets? Brown Berets. Br Brown Beret. Berets. Ber <laughs> <laughs> 
what do we specifically do? Yeah. Well, I, I think well one of the things I, I like to believe is that we we uh, we raised the consciousness of the folks. We they we started we were, we were able to for what we were doing start wearing. For, again, like I said, it took some while, but for them, for all of us to realize that yeah, you know what what the Brown Brown Berets are saying is is right. We are getting shafted in education. We're getting kids that are graduating without with with any, with any skills. We are in the workforces, but we, what, but you know, we, we're not in state employment. The state don't hire us. The uh, re, the county don't hire us. You know, it's always that prejudice and discrimination that that that's followed us. And it wasn't until later on in life, man. I mean, that we, we realized that's happening. Same same in the school system. Even though it's changed, you know, our argument all the time was, man, you know, it'd be nice to get some get some Chicano teachers to teach our Chicano students. You know, it'd be great to get a, Ch a Chicano principal to be in charge of a school. You know, those kinds of things. Um, so, I'm sorry, I just lost my train of thought. Give me that question again, man. Okay. What did you specifically do when okay. you were part? Yeah. So, 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 some things real specifically, like I talked about the awareness. One thing in particular, if you look across the street from here, you'll see the clinica, la clinica. Now that was started by us. That started back in the 70s. At that time, um, we, 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 uh, there, was, there was a store on Robert Street that, that we took over and made that into a clinic, organized some, some doctors and stuff, and made it a free clinic. And that was kind of what was going on back then, too. A lot of free clinics popping up all over. So we started that. And uh, 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 so, that, so I, 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 we, take a, we take a lot of pride on that. One of the things we took a lot of pride into is that uh, we started organizing to getting getting Latino kids, Chicano kids into the into a college. Uh, I remember in '72 and '73 it was just the biggest enrollment. You know, and after that, then now we started seeing we started getting Chicano teachers over here on the west side, the Chicano principal here on the west side. So I think just that awareness with the education system w w was a real plus for us. Um, and uh, you know uh, the things things that we talked about didn't we didn't see uh, I, I can say this it's interesting let me for an example now on the police force you, you'll see Chicanos on the police force you'll see them Wong you you see all those people of color back in '68 when we were fighting with the police about stuff like that you know they just told us we were full of shit you know and uh, so so what's interesting now for me is now to run into some of these guys from these other groups now who are cops and kind of think like, wow, you know, I'm a cop now. But but they don't know or don't remember or don't, I mean, they don't know is that they're a cop because because of what we did back in the 60s, that we took it to the, you know, that we took it to the to the next level. Same with uh, uh, the clues, same with these, 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 these Chicano organizations that's out there right now. Uh, and some of these new t people who are becoming teachers, new principals, the superintendent of our schools now. It's like now it's all of a sudden now it's like, yeah, you know, I, I'm a superintendent or I'm this, I'm that. Yeah, but it, it just didn't happen, man. They need to come and get you and say, okay, you know, we want you. It's about because people people like us were out there protesting. Same with in interpreters in, in hospitals, interpreters in doctor's office. They didn't have that stuff. But we, we had, you know, it, it was a battle. You know, we we got we got, we've got scars on our heads, man, from uh, you know going to bed over some of these things. But in the long run, it happened. And and again, and that's I guess why I'm, I'm glad that you're doing something like this, because again, even our story's got to be told. These folks that are just coming in now from uh, uh, South America, um, Central America, even Mexico. I mean, they they're coming in here now thinking all of a sudden they got a job, and you know, not knowing. Not knowing our history, not knowing about us that we had to work in the goddamn fields, man. You know, that we that we hassled with the police. We did all this stuff, man. And uh, and now that you know, it's like a, um, you know, there's a Chinese proverb that goes something like this: you can you, know, you plant a tree, but you know that you're never going to be able to sit under the, under its shade. It's always going to be the next generation that's going to be able to use that shade. So that's kind of like what we did. We planted that tree. Now all these other folks are starting to get the benefits from that, and that's cool. And that's what we that's what we fought for.
How do you think your time was spent as an activist? Oh man, um, busy, 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 and and I think that's one. Of the, and I, as I said earlier, I was I was blessed to have a wife, um, understanding, understanding about what 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 I needed to do and what I needed to get done. Um, my children, you know, uh, it's the same way too. Because uh, when you're involved with something like this, I mean, you you're gone a lot. Um, but they, they, they believed in what I did. Um, and, and, and what it did too also though, though, so the times I was able to be at home with my wife, the time I was able to be home with my kids, made that time special and made it more quality too. So, so in the long run, I think it helped out. Why were you inspired to take these actions? Uh, You know, it was, uh, again, I think going back to what I said earlier, w once I got educated, let, let, let me, I'll tell you the story. One, one of the things that happened to me when I, when I was a sophomore in high school, I missed 100 days of school. I was at Humboldt and I missed 100 days of school. I, I, I was a dickhead when I was in school. I was, I was always doing something. So I, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in typing class and everybody's jamming. <laughs> And, you know, I, and I couldn't do it. So what did I do? So I don't look like a fool. I would, I would rip the ribbon. I, you probably don't know about typewriters, man. <laughs> but anyway, they had, you know, anyway, they had ribbons in there. And this is where uh, the letters would hit the ribbon and then you get print on the page. But anyway, so what I would do, I would rip the ribbon because I couldn't catch, I couldn't stay on top of the, of, of, of typing. So sometimes I, I throw the, I accidentally drop the typewriter on the floor so my typewriter wouldn't work, so then I didn't have to type. So I did all those things. So right before, right before a, a Christmas vacation, my typing teacher came up to me and said, you know, um, I don't want you in class anymore. And so this is what we're gonna do, this is what, I, this is what, this is what he offered me. I'm, st you're st I'm still gonna get a credit for this class. I don't have to come to class at all, but he's still going to give me credit. He said, and that class was like from two to three, and he said, I don't care what you do at two o'clock. If you want to go home at two o'clock, whatever you want to do, but just don't come to my class. So I missed a hundred days of class, school, plus I missed that whole class, and I still got passed. So now, so now I get out at two o'clock, I'm just, when, I, when my friends find out that I'm, that I'm getting out at two o'clock, you know, hey man, you're getting over on these folks, man. Yeah, yeah, all this kind of stuff, right? And and, and I was, and I thought I did. So that was so now turn the clock forward, and now I'm sitting at the University of Minnesota, in in, uh, in, in, in the social. I don't even remember the class it was, but the instructor said, okay, this is what's happening. They gave me a syllabus, and do, 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 then it says, you know, then you, you got to type 15 pages. And it didn't hit hit me at all until I read that syllabus when he said 15 pages. And it's like, you know, I can't type. I can't type. And here all this time I thought I got over on Mr. Salsley, the typing teacher, but yet he got over on me because he didn't have to deal with me, get out of here. And here I thought and I, said I couldn't type. So, so, that, so that was kind of an, an, an awakening for me. So. Because again, like I said, I, I, I fooled around in school. I thought I couldn't do the work. I believe what the teacher said that I was, you know. So my third semester, no, third quarter at the University of Minnesota, I made the dean's list. And it was like, oh my God, I, how could I make the dean's list? You know, the teachers all said I was a dickhead. My actions always showed that I wasn't, you know. so. All of a sudden, I realized, man, you know what? I don't have to. I, I'm not, you know. So that was a real re re revelation for me, to to think that, to think that man made the dean's list all this time. I thought I was this, when really, if I applied myself, I could, I could, you know, I could do things, you know. So that was kind of a real awakening for me. And then, boom, that, that like I said, then that moved me forward, to finding out about the Chicanos. All I mean, all the my all the all the. Uh, the, 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 the things that my ancestors did, did in the making of America, man, that just made me, you know, really a, a proud. Yeah, I apologize for swearing like that, you know. Excuse me, I, wherever I'm talking to on that thing, man. I mean, I'm sorry about that.
Seeing the way the West Side is today, what would you do differently if you could? Um, one of the things I would ch I would like I would like to see change on the West Side would be you know it, it's like the West Side. We you know they, we talk about the diversity in, uh, ethnic diversity. We got a whole bunch of different folks in here, you know, which is cool. The thing that we really don't have a lot is that economic diversity, you know, and, and, and I think that's that's what has to happen. I think we have to have more of that economic diversity because if we if if, if we don't, the West Side is going to become the center of poverty. So it's just going to be just uh, just you know, and, and, and nothing on poor folks. It's just that. When you have a poor community, you're going to get poor services from the city. You're going to get poor services from the, from the state. And that's how they see you as being poor and no voice, that kind of stuff. And I think that that's, that's what I think we need to show. So, uh, you know, for an example, the West Side, we have a lot, you know, uh, 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 El Manacer, El Burrito, the Boca Chica, which is, which is, which is fine, you know, but... We ought to have some Italian restaurants. We ought to have some Asian restaurants. We ought, we ought to have all, you know, you know. And, and, and a couple of years ago, we just had stores that sell cowboy boots and cowboy hats. And like, okay, that's, I mean, I understand that. But three stores on the west side like that? Come on, you know, let's, let's get some little boutiques. Let's, you know, make make this place look, have, have, have again, have that diversity economically. So folks that want to come here, there's more places for them to come and shop. There's more places for them to come and eat. So all, you know. So when you, I, I believe. So when you have this, when the kids are uh, leaving, walking on the west side, going to school, going wherever they're going, they're seeing positive things. They're not walking by Parque Castillo and see a bunch of dudes out there drunk, drunk, passed out on the out there, you know. Or they're not walking up the street and seeing graffiti on, on the walls. There's, you know, you, you're seeing something positive that's saying, "All oh, right, man, this is this is cool," you know. But I understand you, you. You, I grew up like I mean, I grew up with all that kind of stuff that I just mentioned to you. But there's all, always that balance. You have to have that balance, and that's what I would look for. That balance. How do you think you made the West Side a better place? Oh, I, I would have to turn that around and, and say that you know the West Side made me a better person. You know, I, I, I think again with the, the context that I made, the people that I've met, um, the things that, the things that we did together as a community. Uh, you know, uh, made me made me who, who made me who I am today, and uh, you know, uh, I don't know if you know that you know they named the field after me. Out there, the, the athletic fields are named after me. Yeah, I got that a couple years ago, and that that was that was such an honor. Um, and you know, how did you do this, Gilbert? You know, that, that, that's what well, that, that that's the thing that was telling me. The people were asking me that, but yet when I really when I think about it, I mean, obviously, again, you know, you can't do this stuff alone, man. You know, so again, it's the people that stood that I stood shoulder to shoulder with, man, and and, and we did things together. That's what I. That's what I think made made me what I am. The West Side made me who I was today. Um, you know, sometimes the jury's still out on who I am, man. But uh, but all, but all in all, though, I I think I'm, I think I'm okay. What advice would you give a young adult who's trying to make a difference in the world? I would say, uh, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid, man. If uh, you know, uh, they said if uh, if dreams were horses, even beggars would ride. You know, and uh, you know, I think that I think that's what it's about, man. If, if you if you if you if you believe in something, and and, and, uh, and, and, and you know, be a little strong enough that you, that you want to you know you want to do something about it, man. You, you got to go for it. Yeah, you're gonna fall down, man. You're gonna fall down. You're gonna get stepped on, and all that. And, and that's then that's okay. I mean, there's nothing wrong about getting your ass whooped, getting knocked down, man. It's about if you stay down. You know, that's the key. Don't stay down. Get back up. And I'd say surround surround yourself with with, with folks that think the same way that you do. Uh, 
surround yourself with with folks that are that are um, that you know again no, no matter what 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 it is that that you, that you want to get involved with you know you got to get folks that are on the same page with you but don't be afraid man don't be afraid to to call someone a dickhead if he's a dickhead man you know don't be don't be afraid to take that step you know it's always it's always that it's always that's always a difficulty man is that first step once you take that first step man then 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 it comes man but taking that first step um and, and and again, I mean that that's I, I again I can't say this enough, and it's really cool what you guys are doing today, you know what you're doing at your school down there too, you know that experimental kind of stuff, man. You, you're getting your hands, getting your hands wet, you're getting your hands dirty, you're finding out how that stuff is, man. Because I tell you, life is hell, you know. There's a lot of good things in life, man. I mean, you're, and, and and it's going to be bumpy, it's going to be bumpy, but uh, I mean that that that's what life's about, man. Life would be a drag if it was just everything was working out for you, man. You know? Is there anything you would like to add that we didn't mention? Uh, uh, probably no. I guess I would just say that you know, there's in, 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 again in our community, or any community. I mean, there's a lot of good folks in that community uh, to get things done. You, you know, surround yourself with the, with those kinds of folks. You know, I, I've had the opportunity to be around. I know what I would say: work to your full potential. Work to your full potential. Uh, I, I saw too many kids, especially in the '90s, when the, when the gang stuff came to our community, and saw so many kids who had that potential. Man, had that potential to be real good. I mean, to do something positive, but got caught up in that stuff, man. And now they're sitting in a joint. Uh, in 1992, we had uh, about seven kids that were killed from around here, right around, right around here. About another 15 that got incarcerated. Uh, and they were, and, and, it, and it really bothered me a lot because a lot of those kids, I knew a lot of them. You know, I, I coached them in football or in baseball or something like that. But uh, you know, that that attraction to uh, quick bread or whatever it was, man. But so. So I can tell folks, if you can work to your potential, man, you know, uh, and get a good education, life life is going to be okay for you, man. It's just, it's, it, the more you can l leave the frustrations and drama out of your life, man, <laughs> it's going to be a lot better. But again, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Thank you.